So good morning, um, everyone that's listening to this interview. I am utterly delighted today to have three amazing doctors who are going to be answering some pretty tough and challenging questions that I know many people in the group have sort of offered up for discussion. And I've got Dr. Boon Lim, Dr. Deepak Ravindran, and Dr. Melanie Danny. And what I'd like to do is just ask the three of you to very briefly introduce yourselves. Maybe there are some people who haven't yet watched any of the interviews and they've come to this one first. So Mel, why don't we come to you first? Just tell us a tiny bit about who you are, where you work, what you do. Thanks so much, Susie. Lovely to see you. So I am a, uh, obviously I've met you before and uh, we've done some of the webinars. Um, I'm a doctor in Northwest London. So I specialize in general adult medicine and older people, but I do a, I work in a syncope clinic with Boone, um, looking at people who've come in with fainting or autonomic problems. Um, and so we've I've sort of come into this space, having seen a lot of people coming with syncope and autonomic problems following COVID. Mm, great. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Deepak, let's hear from you. Uh, good morning, all of you, and I hope you watched our previous sort of uh, interview and I was talking to Susie as well. Again, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Deepak Ravindran and I'm a consultant uh, and I'm leading the Berkshire Long COVID service in Reading. So I work at the Royal Berkshire uh, Hospital and I'm a full-time NHS consultant with a uh, specialism in pain medicine as my background. And we've been seeing long COVID patients now since November end 2020 when we set up the clinic. So that's been my experience of looking after long COVID patients. Thanks Deepak, wonderful, welcome. And uh, Boone, let's hear from you, hi. Uh, thanks, good morning Susie. My name is Boone Lim, I am a cardiology consultant and I'm based at Hammersmith Hospital, which is a hospital in Northwest London. And I, uh, it's affiliated to Imperial College London and I run the uh, Imperial Syncope Diagnostic Unit. And uh, for my uh, sins, I, I did a PhD in the role of the autonomic nervous system in human heart rhythm uh, arrhythmias or heart rhythm abnormalities. And uh, that kind of gave me a grounding into heart rate and heart rate variability and the autonomic nervous system in general. And therefore, from then on, I took over the Imperial Syncope unit and we run tilt table testing to the tune of about 800 tilts a year, which I report. And there began the experience with understanding the complex physiology involved in tilting or orthostasis or changing postures. And so with the, um, with the uh, explosion of COVID and long COVID in particular, we've seen a lot more patients come to access our service for tilt table testing. And uh, we published the initial description of autonomic dysfunction in long COVID um, on the 1st of January, uh, 2021. Uh, which is a freely available article. And, and from then on, um, I had a few more patients come to visit our clinic or have been referred in. Um, and, and so this, this is the experience which we, we would like to share. Fantastic. Thanks, Boone. Well, it's an utter delight to have the three of you together because I think this is a very complimentary set of brains in the room today. So let's crack on. Um, obviously, people are out there still trying to come to some kind of understanding about what's happening for them. And this question of why and how and what can we do is this sort of this ongoing search that many people with long COVID are putting themselves on and it can be quite a stressful journey. And I think many people are looking for the answer, you know, this kind of this one silver bullet, perhaps even if, if it's ever going to exist, which, you know, chances are it's not. Um, and I think, you know, what I would love us to do today is just to explore all the things that people can do to help themselves um, and to, you know, if, if we can talk about what we want to kind of leave people with is a sense of hope, because I think that's probably one of the most important pieces that people need right now. Um, but let's just come to, you know, to the kind of nitty gritty right now. You've been seeing all of you people with COVID and long COVID for, you know, two years. And what I'm really interested in is, are, are, are the symptoms presenting differently? Has it changed shape? You know, how is it showing up clinically at the moment? Are the, are the same conditions arising again and again or are different things emerging? I think that's something that, that is interesting us with the different variants as well. Um, I haven't assigned a name to this one. So who would like to go first? 
Deepak, why don't we come to you? Because the long cl COVID clinic kind of puts you in a good space for that one. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, now we're almost 15, 20, coming close to two years now. I'm still getting referrals from patients who are starting to have their symptoms back in March, April, 2020. Mm -hmm. So we are still getting referrals from that long. And the most recent set of referrals are coming from around September of last year. So those have been how the referrals have come through there. And still most of the patients who come to our clinic are those from the community. So those who have been non-hospitalized and who have been struggling with symptoms beyond three to six months after having had the initial acute infection. Now, the Omicron variant is still unknown. I've not yet received any referrals from the last November, December time as yet, but the patients are predominantly coming with fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, and then pain in multiple aches and joints. I wouldn't say it's pain, they call it as aches and joints uh, in different parts of the body there. And then there is the inevitable other measures like uh, loss of taste or smell, which is present in some people there, the change in smell. But by and large, I'd probably say these are the main things, fatigue and shortness of breath, and that inability to really get that brain fog, you know, that cognitive changes that they're not able to remember and recollect what they did. And the sadness is that because these patients are all between the ages of 30 to 60, who have been functional and fully active and productive, leaving really full, happy lives, just not able to get back to where they wanted to be, that is almost bringing a level of mental health uh, disturbance as well, new onset anxiety and depression. Oh, I mean, to, to, um, <clears throat> to add to that, to that commentary, which is uh, very similar to our experience, we don't have a specific long COVID clinic, but we do offer tilt table testing to other services, including our respiratory led long COVID clinic at Imperial College based at St. Mary's. And um, we, I, I, I have been asked to give a few talks on uh, autonomic dysfunction to this group of physicians and physiotherapists. Um, but the 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 point about how things are changing and, and the point I want to pick up on is that I see relatively few um, patients who have just come out of COVID. And, and, and typically, the time frame, as you say, is six to nine months by the time they hit me. And I suspect it's three to six months by the time they hit the long COVID clinic, i.e. you. And <clears throat> I would just say that there is a lot that goes on in three to six months with somebody's not physical state, but mental state, because that is a hell of a long time for somebody who's fully functional, have a career, a family, and many things they're aspiring to in life at the prime of life, so to speak, to be set back and to have that uncertainty. And so I think this particular uh, series of talks or webinars that you organize, Susie, are very, very important because signposting patients, even before they hit your clinic, where they get very good advice, albeit six or nine months too late, is a phenomenal way to reach out and help the NHS resources because that's what we need. We need good quality information that's sensible and that's holistic and that gives people hope. And so that would be my my only comment, uh, which is which is great job, Susie. And you know, we got to think about how we can use forums like this to push out to more people to access before they hit us. Because by the time they hit us nine months later, there's something wired into the into the mindset, into the brain, and into the body, um, which is then very much more difficult to unpick. I need to ask on Zoom now, where's the thumbs up button? <laughs> <laughs> and that leads on to actually my observation, which is obviously the first time we started to see patients with long COVID, or I mean, it was only really coined, I think, in the medical literature in September 2020. And people started to describe long haul COVID June 2020, so a couple of months after. And it really at that stage was this conundrum that was totally inexplicable. Um, and patients were obviously very frustrated um, and coming and nobody knew anything about it. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. But latterly, I would say, the patients that I've seen that have been coming with symptoms feel much more informed and empowered. And by the time they come to clinic, they often have looked at webinars they've been on online forums that often you know they've been on your group Susie um, and they can come much more informed and having 
done some of that lifestyle um, and conservative measures. So it is changing, I think. And I I, I would say that there does seem to be more, um, yeah, more hope, really, and people know that their course. You may have... You may have dropped me out of internet there a moment. Uh, you, 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 uh, were, you were coming across clear, at least your video was. Uh, oh, okay. So, so that's fine. <laughs> I'm back in the room. Hi. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I heard most of what you said, Mel. Um, I think people really are educating themselves. You know, the, I have never seen a drive like, like this before because I suppose there's never needed to have been one of people absolutely desperate to get access to information, to share information, you know, mm. and in many ways, they're so ahead of the game, you know, anything, anything around the world that's coming out as a new piece of research or, you know, there's, there's suddenly, you know, 50,000 people have jumped on it and they're starting to disseminate it around other groups. And, and in some ways that's helpful. And in some ways it's not because, you know, it opens people up to, oh, someone over there in that country is doing this. And how do we get access to that? That might be the thing that's going to help me. Oh, and there's a price tag attached to it. Ah, oh, so what do we do now? When's it going to come into the UK? When are the NHS going to make it available? And so all of these things, these constant kind of, you know, pull, pull and push of the desire to, to get help and the right kind of help. And I think a lot of people are left feeling really, you know, as, as Deepak says, very frustrated and, and, and sort of, you know, confused about well, well, what is happening with me and what- Well, I got, so, you know, this is an important point that needs to be tackled head on, uh, Susie, and, and, and maybe a point at which we should say that, uh, that COVID, due to the multifaceted mechanisms that can cause COVID, uh, I'd like people to think of the analogy of the blind man and the elephant. So there's a very good uh, parable of the six blind men of Hindustan who all go to see an elephant. And uh, the guy who touches the side of the elephant thinks the elephant is a wall and the guy who touches the tusk thinks it's a spear and so on and so forth. And so, you know, when you go and see an ologist, i.e. a cardiologist like me, and let's suppose the cardiologist, because what he has, looking at the uh, diagnostic tools he has would be an echo, an ACG, an MRI scan, a halter, he would be able to very clearly characterize whether you have a myocarditis, for example, on an MRI scan, or whether you have any arrhythmias to explain your palpitations. But would he really know anything about your uh, irritable bowel or your joint aches? So then he might say, okay, go and see a rheumatologist, because that's who you need to see. And the rheumatologist may not really get so much of the palpitations and breathlessness and so on and so forth. It goes around this merry-go-round of ologists, right? None of whom see the elephant in the room. And with the advent of uh, the kind of webinars that you're doing, I think more and more patients come in with a holistic view, perhaps. Some of them are still very focused on the elephant's tusk, i.e. they need plasma apheresis in Europe or Germany, because that is the one thing that's going to focus their their uh, the the treatment to to make them all better but everyone needs to see both us i.e us lot who are very close-minded in our silos by and large because it's a necessary evil of advancing medicine and subspecialisms i can't train to be anything more than a cardiologist and even within cardiology i'm not very good at for example um opening up arteries or angioplasty i'm i'm decent I'm a decent electrophysiologist and autonomic specialist, but I, you, I wouldn't know how to open up an artery, let alone anything about joints, inflammation. So we need, we need a bigger picture. And this bigger picture, unfortunately, can never truly be fully satisfied with the group of physicians who are super specialists in the way that they deliver reductionist-based healthcare. And so we need to elevate. And the way to elevate is education, I think, which is what we're doing now. But I'd just like to make the point that you 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 can't be harsh on the people, on the person sit, sitting in front of you when you're asking for A, B, C, and D, and they say, I just don't know, because truly they, they really don't know. And coming away from any consult in that way, if you're a patient and you're seeing an ologist, including me, uh, and not having that, that certainty of the answer that you want to have, like, what is my autoantibody immune state? And I say, I don't know, because we don't have a test. The NHS don't commission such tests. It is, is going to be something that sets you back from a negative 
psychological standpoint. So I don't know, I just throw it out there to, 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 to say that it's a very important point. When you come in to see a doctor, you have your expectations and you, you exercise a bit of, uh, not patience, but understanding with what's going on with this complex disease. I think, uh, Boone, that itself, you know, it's fantastic you say that because that requires a great level of reflection and humility to be honest with the patient at that point to say, I don't know. I, the, and I, I sympathize with a lot of the patients who come through because I see both sides of it. I work in a district general hospital there. So sometimes patients get referred to me and, I, and they are quite insistent that there is I have all these problems, but I have a palpitations and I'm getting chest pain when I take deep breaths. And I do need to see a cardiologist because I'm worried about this. And I think there is a role that needs to be played by that because it's how I think we set the standards and expectations. So there is a lot, I suppose, that the GPs or the first port of call that patients have can have a role in also helping patients understand that helping that each of the specialisms are there for a reason. They have a role to fulfill these silos, even if they are silos, have a role to play. They are important because they give such depth and expertise. For example, the studies that are coming out now are really good because 10 years ago, if it were not for COVID, a lot of the patients that I would be seeing who would have these POTS-like symptoms or cardiology, palpitation symptoms, respiratory issues, fatigue, chronic fatigue itself, would not have an answer. And, and to me, I feel delighted that at least there are these experts who are doing these individual works to coming out with research that's hopeful, that's looking at the right direction. However, there must be somebody to sort of hold them. And I think you're absolutely right in how we use education to bring up our patients to also understand what they should be asking their specialists and GPs, and also our GPs and physios, the first port of call, these people, that what should they be putting in place as expectations? If they are going to say, oh, go to that person, they will sort you out. And sometimes in pain management, I get that, oh yeah, the pain clinic will sort everything out. I get that burden of pressure and that often leads mm. to sometimes conversations that can get a bit challenging because the patient has put so much hope and investment in traveling that far, for example, to come and see somebody in central London from the outer end of Berkshire, that dashing of hope itself can result in anger and frustration. So I think there is a lot that the system needs to do in supporting our patients. And I think Susie, as, as Boone has already said, elevating the whole level of the education part, at least that piece of knowing and being aware of everyone's limitations is really an important aspect here. And a final, a final thing that I would say is that I, I completely agree with all of this, but we mustn't ever underestimate the power of the patient voice. And I know we've talked about this before. And actually it's only by virtue of the fact that so Absolutely. many patients came to the clinic saying, I'm having palpitations, I'm feeling dizzy, you know, I'm having joint pains or, or whatever, that doctors and researchers stood up and noticed and said, okay, well, what is this? And this is why we need to research it. And, you know, it's the power of the patient voice that the NIHR in the UK have put 25 million pounds or 20 million pounds into, NA, into long COVID research. And in America, the NIH have pledged a billion dollars. Exactly. And, and that is the patient, you know, that is, it's patients that can, that can inform policy and put pressure on government. So in many ways, yes, have understanding on, on your team, but on, on your doctors and the people that you see and understand the enormous uncertainty that we're all faced with, but carry on patients doing, doing what you're doing, because um, it's that that moves us forward and actually gets the specialists talking together and learning from each other. And, you know, the very fact that we and our meeting Deepak and, you know, different long COVID clinics meet and different specialists meet is how we can all equip ourselves. And I wonder whether the future of, of long COVID, we call it long COVID, and it's a very crude term for what is probably a whole spectrum of different things. And we know that COVID itself is a very complex infection. We've seen so many different aspects of it. And it's likely that when we do get answers, which are coming and will hopefully be coming, there may well be different spectrums and a, a whole range of different conditions and diseases. And I suppose one of the things that we need to do is learn 
all of us, and it's easier to say this as a clinician as it is as a patient, is that patients and learning to sort of deal with things on a day-to-day -day basis while those answers come in. And that's why your programme is so helpful, um, because it's focusing on what the things that we can control. So learning to control symptoms and accept them and focusing on wellness and the things that we can do to promote and elevate our health, like rest and diet and a good exercise programme. Because regardless of what those answers are, when they come, whether that's you know six months or 10 years or whatever, we, there are certains that we know of, which are the things that, that you teach, Susie, um, and the, the sort of fundamentals of health. And that is what we should be holding on to while we wait for these answers, if they ever come. Exactly. And that's always been my point. You know, you've got yourself on the waiting list for the long COVID clinic and your appointments in seven months time. What are you going to do between now and then? Are you going to sit down and wait? Or are you going to do stuff that actually we all pretty much know will, will help at least to manage the general homeostasis of the body, which is really, really important because you don't want to allow yourself to deteriorate even more. And actually, I think, you know, number one is everyone needs a life raft to hang on to. So if you believe that you're doing something to help yourself, that in itself has a profound impact on your health. If you feel like that life raft has gone or isn't coming for six, seven months, then you're drowning. You know, you have that experience of I am lost. I am helpless. I can't cope. And that's a whole down, downward slippery slope that no one wants to find themselves on. But people are finding themselves on. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of just hang on to whatever life raft is there and just hold on tight and believe in it, you know, and, and it's going to take you somewhere good. <laughs> and take control of what you can control. Right. Have the, some have some agency. Yeah. yeah I, the awareness, Susie, actually, I found it quite surprising. And uh, when patients come to the long COVID clinic there, they waited exactly as, as Mel has pointed out and you're saying, you know, five, four to five months waiting time, sometimes longer than that. And what they have realized and what I have actually realized, I think the surprising part was that they might have not been actually watching any kind of social media or TV. There are still people who have not gone on to certain websites because they're afraid of what they might see or hear or they might not be able to make sense of it and that might worry them some more so there are people who i'd ask them you know so have you seen any of the support groups or have you gone on social and they'll say no no i don't believe in that i just wanted to hear it from someone mm -hmm. there and i think that is that necessary gap we need to find a way or how to work with patients to actually give them this life raft as you said while they are waiting for it, because you're absolutely right. If they're waiting and their agency is not there because they're worried about why they are like this, then they decondition. They, all those thoughts that Boone talked about, about how their physical, emotional, and spiritual health changes is all going to be set on a slippery slope. So I think we need to make more awareness and find ways to get message out that there is support groups like yourself available that can still function as effective life rafts before they come and see or go to a long COVID service. <clears throat> and, and I guess this is helpful, Susie. You've got uh, Mel, Deepak and, and myself. And I guess people can look up our, our credentials because one of the challenges are which support group would you listen to? Uh, you know, there, there are many out there and there are many, I guess, with a uh, as you alluded to, Susie, a kind of uh, a kind of click at the end to say, for more help, uh, please click on this link, which sends you to a website that opens up a diagnostics package or or, or something else. So, I, I you know I do private practice, but I, in this webinar, I don't talk about it uh, because this is not the purpose of this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is giving a level of education and information for patients to be able to understand and take the first steps in their in their healing. And I think it's very important that the nidus of control sits, the locus sits within yourself and hanging on to that life craft, knowing that you can already do something now is what the people who are waiting or even not waiting, even having seen the person on the first long COVID clinic should continue to develop that skill to be able to see 
the action that that can be taken from within. Because if you take the nidus of control outside and if you depend on Boon Lim or Deepak for that magic tablet, the magic painkiller, the magic acupuncture point or the, um, or the Botox injection that can help with your neck pain, it's, it's, not, it's always gonna lead in disappointment. Whereas if you take control yourself with a, a broad-based educational program like you deliver in your program, Susie, um, it, it is going to be so much holistic in terms of healing and the patient can take control back. And this sense of control uh, helps so much with the, with the mindset. And, and, and I guess what we do, all of us, I guess, in our clinics, and I know Mel does this, I'm sure you do this, Deepak, is we educate and we empower the patients, right? So that they come out of the clinic and they know they've got it. Um, so, you know, the, these are very important uh, non-trivial points that, that, that you know should be brought out there and the patient should understand. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, okay, good. So I, I have my list of questions that I we could talk for hours and we've always said that. We, <laughs> we're gonna stick to <clears throat> the next couple of questions. Okay, here we go. So Deepak, I am gonna come to you. Uh, the efficacy of the long COVID clinic seems to vary wild, wildly here, and I wondered how much clinic heads talk together and share their stories of best practice. Your clinic, I know, offers a range of complementary offerings to support clinical interventions, whereas others offer very little. Are there guidelines for long COVID clinics now? Is the variation down to funding and resource due to the different regions? Just give us a kind of heads up on how that works. Um, thanks, Susie, for the question there. So I got the opportunity actually to uh, September 2020 to actually co-author a paper with Trisha Greenhalg. I think she was in the process of writing up uh, some work to submit to the House of Lords because at that was the point of time that there were lots of activity in the media and we were starting to recognize that a lot of people were struggling after having COVID. And so we had written up uh, an article and, and I contributed to actually saying we should be having a step care model because I was seeing, I, I had a really bad uh, attack of COVID at the end of March, 2020, and it lasted 15 days. I mean, I had my share of man flu, but that was the worst two weeks of my life. And, and, I, and I realized how long it was taking for me to get back to normal. And I saw a lot of my colleagues at that time recovering much longer than what we would have expected for a viral flu. And I was seeing the same trend across there. So I got lucky in working with Trisha there. And we put forward this idea that long COVID clinics should have this sort of uh, a community and intermediate and secondary care, or at least whichever, a sort of specialist model there. And there should be, and I'd, and I'd sort of said, it should have the same elements as what we have for pain management, because there is a multitude of system impact and conditions like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. So that was a, a, a sort of exaptation, an adaptation from that kind of model into at least saying this is as holistic as it gets because people with long COVID seem to be having multiple symptoms impacted. While you can choose to investigate one system and go down the rabbit hole, we need to keep in mind the remaining symptoms as well, because each one is connected to the other. So that was the initial initiative there. And, and, you know, we know what happened with the NHS then coming out because apparently this is how I understand that the House of Lords met at the end of September. They had three, four pieces of evidence, including our paper. And that was what triggered that initial decision and ask of the NHS to set up a clinic and NICE to then formulate guidelines. So if you look at the guidelines and you look at what the NICE has said, they have asked for a holistic integrated service there. The reality then often hits because when that first tranche of 10 million money came down through different uh, NHS organizations down to where it must be created, a service must be done, it was almost approaching the second lockdown. The cases were again starting to climb up. It was really left to interested uh, people or in most places, it would be either the respiratory teams who were most seeing the patients. And in other places, because psychology and mental health was raising up, it was the community behavior management teams that got most useful and they were ready to take on the load. So I think that is what has led to a variation in how long COVID services are set up. 
whether they are set up in the community, whether they are set up in a hospital setting, whether they are staffed and led by one particular specialism or different specialism. And I, because I had this knowledge and there, when the time came and the money arrived in my area of Berkshire, my organization asked, well, okay, you've been doing the stuff and talking about it. Do you want to lead on setting it up? So I brought my bias into it, into saying, well, what it should look like. But then there would be so many other people doing the same. So I think, as Boone initially said, we all come in with our particular specialisms and knowledge and biases there. Some of it may turn to be good. Some of it will have its advantages and disadvantages. And I think that's why lots of your listeners on today and even patients will be seeing that variation in different practices. They won't understand why it is because all of them have the badge of a long COVID clinic and you sort of think everything should be the same. The reality is when in December, when it came, it was different sets of people who had the time and the knowledge and the readiness to actually take that money and do something with it. And that's the led to the variation in practice. My area, I was lucky in that I had my organization backing me up to say, here you go. This is, we've got out of the 10 million that came cascading down, we got initially about 200,000 to 50,000. And they said, well, here you go. This is it. Here's a transformation manager for you. Here's a physio there. I had a physio and a psychology from my pain service already there. I had a GP who was looking after complex long-term conditions also ready. So I had luckily a clinical team and I had luckily a managerial team. I had the money so I could actually fashion it like the way I'd contributed to the article. I could fashion it in there. And then that was a time when the NHS charities came along. I'd rather we were becoming aware. So that was the time I said, well, why don't we get the idea as a team? We thought, why couldn't we pitch to the NHS charities and say, we are going to provide an X number of support for long COVID patients via the NHS. There's only certain evidence-based stuff we can do. But I had already realized, and I think it was probably the time that Mel and uh, Dan, you know, Boone were also understanding and they already could see the patterns of the autonomic thing. To me, it seemed to be clear that if we had to calm a threatened immune and nervous system, a combined system down, then actually reaching out to simple grounding-based therapies of mind-body therapies, as I'd call it for simple fun, is useful. And that's where I thought, well, you know, if I can get a bit of money and I can tell patients, I support you, I will hold your hand while we figure this out, I can give you some subsidized access to complementary therapies that you can check out, then that might just be something that keeps them engaged and has something to do. Exactly as you said, you know, what can people do to stay on a life raft while they are waiting for something useful and tangible or a drug or a medication. You know, at that time, even I did not know what would turn up. But that's where the choice or thought of having some complementary therapies that are funded came along. And we got that money around June or July of last year. And we were able to make some links with community organizations to actually say, can we provide these patients with these kinds of support while we hold on and provide what the NHS is asking us to do. So I think that's where I got the opportunity and our team got the opportunity to give complementary therapies there. I know that's very unusual for any other long COVID service there, um, but I think it's just a matter of right place, right time, and, and, a, and a very supportive management, really. Can I ask you a question, Deepak, please? Um, yeah. To, you know, it, the, the setup you have sounds uh, very well thought and actually um, getting to the point uh, of the patient's illness. In other words, you're seeing the full elephant in its full form and, and, and treating patients without this reductionist siloed approach. The, the question I have is to what extent can a long COVID clinic deliver this service to the masses in a forum like we have now and in a forum that Susie is very used to running, which is a Zoom or online portal where the information is communicated by a relevant coach or trainer who is well-versed at you know, picking out individuals within the Zoom. So suddenly you expand your service to 20 patients at a time. And if you do this five days a week, your, your long COVID wait list will suddenly come down. And 
you know, is that is that a model that you think the NHS will will pick up? Certainly, I mean, uh, there are probably some of things I want to clarify, Boone, to understand the question right there. I think we need more people like Susie who are needing to be trained up, who should be available at a system level there, who are aware of the condition and can disseminate the knowledge and do it at scale. So that is definitely there. The money that has come up to now and that has come to each and every PCN, you know, after the initial 10 million, another 70 million came and totally about, I think 30 million went to primary care and about 70 million pounds have been given to other specialist care to ensure that all areas, about 90 such long COVID clinics exist uh, up and down through the country in England right now. Um, so I think we overall got about 400,000 pounds, 500,000 pounds for Berkshire to set up what we have done. And in the last three months, uh, we've actually worked with our community partners. Now we've got two more physios, psychologists, nutritionists, the whole community teams to start developing group support. So they are now going to be doing Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, groups of 20 each to take them through a long COVID program. But that is the second step. The assessment part still remains. And I think that's the piece which, which I feel that long COVID clinics should think about doing better because that first assessment um, for a variety of psychological reasons, I think it's useful if there is a medical personnel on board to reassure the patient that we are looking at you, we are looking after you, we are investigating what needs to be investigated and we've made sure the explanation is as accurate at that point of time. So that's where I think I am aware that a lot of long COVID clinics have often been set up with paper triages and being seen by other healthcare professionals there and some patients who come from Southampton or other parts to, or, the, or Slough or you know the neighboring areas, they come into us, they kind of say, well, we would have liked to see a doctor or someone because we are worried about whether it could be heart, whether it could be lung. Nobody's done something for us and nobody's explained to us about it. And I think that's a gap we need to find out how to plug it, whether we can afford to have a doctor, a GP or a consultant in all such clinics provide that level of first support, or can we upskill people like Susie, coaches, trainers, physios, to take on that responsibility and help to provide that? I think that's something even I don't have the answer for and the resources I'm not sure will cover there. I can tell you what we are doing in our service out here. So part of that arrangement of that we got 50,000 pounds from NHS charities. We've now finally got about 15 or 20,000 pounds and we're working with a community organization. And what we want to do is we've identified that there are going to be ethnic minorities, people from ethnically diverse areas, people from deprived areas who may not be aware of the service, who may not be aware of what help is out there, who may not be aware or able to be digitally literate to access services like this. So we are going to work with them to actually say, can we coach the community leaders? What, what is an American term of called culturally congruent coaching? So to get that signed of understanding of long COVID and support resources at a community level in multiple languages so that we fan out and provide a constant amount of information that is high, as accurate as possible, has empathetic as possible and take it out into Berkshire so that we can scale up and bring up community and primary care to be where we are so that patients don't have to wait in the swamp of uncertainty and too much knowledge without knowing appropriate knowledge. So that's the attempt we are doing in our area and we got the people in place now to put it into action and it's going to be a lot of talking and awareness raising over the next six months. Thank you. Thanks, Deepak. What I do know is that, uh, you know, a lot of people that work within the NHS, a lot of doctors, a lot of specialists, they watch these videos. <laughs> so what I'm hoping is that people are listening and going, hmm, that's a really interesting idea. Maybe we should <laughs> have a bit of a chat about that. You know, it, this is the way that we spread thoughts, right? Um, and it's very easy to do these days. So thank you for um, sharing that, because I think if we can spread that kind of thought quite widely, that would be really, that would be really good. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to move on 
Boone, we're going to come to you on dysautonomia and POTS. So um, there are two of the more common diagnoses that people end up with long COVID. Do you think enough is known just generally about both of these conditions yet across the board at kind of grassroots GP level? Um, and if not, what can we advise patients to do to help support getting a diagnosis of this kind and to not be fobbed off with anxiety and offered CBT? Um, let's hear some thoughts on that one. Uh, so, so the answer is I don't think enough is known about the dysautonomia and POTS aspect in long COVID. Um, the specific answer to the question is very challenging because it implies that there are two things that can be controlled. One is the interaction from the doctor's side, i.e. what the doctors know, doctor's knowledge base about these conditions. And secondly, which is thankfully under your patient's control is what they expect from the consultation. So I think you can modify one of those things, i.e. if you're listening to this and you're a patient and you're about to approach somebody in a long COVID clinic who may not be an autonomic specialist, um, uh, your expectations need to be set. And so when you attend a clinic, uh, recognize that, that this condition, dysautonomia and POTS, may not be at the fingertips of the person that you're seeing and actually exercise some degree of compassion and forgiveness, I guess, which is, um, which, which I also have to remind myself because when patients come to see me and they talk about something that I'm not familiar with, like say antibody screening or irritable bowel, sometimes I also see this frustration and interaction because they really wanted to come to my clinic to talk about their bowel or their reflux, which is which is not my silo or not my specialty skill set. So you're asking the converse question when patients are coming to a, say, gastroenterologist or rheumatologist talking about POTS, they may not get the cardiac bit. And so to come away from any clinic and not be frustrated is the first thing that I would advise your patients to, 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 um, to exercise, which is we are all human, like all four of us in this room. And we have uh, kind of, our own skills, uh, which are all different. And we have our own interaction skills. My dad used to say to me, you've got five fingers, none of them are the same length. So I can't compare you to your brothers. Mm. And, you know, you can't compare this doctor, this great Dr. Deepak to your the guy that you're going to see. So wow. how, how yeah, he's looking behind him. So how are you going to how are you going to set that expectations? Well, you you exercise that forgiveness right at the start. And here's a top tip. When you go and see the doctor, say, good morning, doc. How have you been? How's the day treated you? That immediately sets a phenomenal tone when you when you come into that, that consulting space, right? And actually, it uplifts your tone as well and creates a very, very much more friendly environment, not... Uh, I want this antibody test and I want a pill. So um, I think I'm skirting the issue slightly. You're, you're saying, I mean, the, the question is, what can we advise patients to do to help support getting a diagnosis of this kind? And I guess the doctor on the other side is part of the question. And if they don't believe or they don't know about it, you may not get a diagnosis of this kind. And so what you can do is equip yourself with the education that we're experiencing now. For example, you're listening to this webinar. And the other thing I would say is think of your, your illness as a, you know, almost a compass plot, right? Uh, another way of looking at the blind man analogy is a, a compass plot. And a compass plot is where you have north, south, east, west. And the doctor you're seeing may be looking at the palpitation, say up north, but down south where your gut is, uh, they may not know. And down to the West where your neurological brain fog system uh, is, is not quite right. And down to the East is where shortness of breath is. And the Northwest is where you got some mast cell issues, waking up with palpitations, with flushing. And so if you, you draw this compass plot on yourself and you try and ask yourself, look, the doctor I'm seeing, he is a ologist of some description. Let's say he's a neurologist and you're gonna focus your symptoms on the brain fog and stuff, right? and not necessarily the palpitations. Likewise, when you see a cardiologist or your compass plot should, I mean, the, the symptoms that they would be able to deal with on your plot would be more to do with palpitations. And, and so this compass plot uh, 
necessarily chart or map to the different specialities that you're seeing. And it's very rare to get a generalist who understands this, this whole uh, compass plot. And one of the research ideas that, you know, I'll push by Deepak because you're in a position to make a difference is to try and get a mechanistically guided assessment and treatment. So your phenotypic characterization of patients, possibly on the shape of the plot. So if somebody looks like a five-pointed star, then you know it's a global dysautonomic pattern. If somebody looks like a very sharp pointing towards mast cell, then it's mainly mast cell. And a treatment needs to be mast cell directed. And that could be a helpful way of looking at things. At this present moment, we don't have such a strategy for characterization. But you know, perhaps, Susie, in your interviews, in the group of patients that you have, it's one way to advance the, the, the knowledge because I think a bit of history taking, clinical examination findings can often point us into the direction that we need to go to. Um, know yourself, you know, how, how can I not be frustrated and to be fobbed off with anxiety and CBT? Know yourself and actually um, be, be empowered with the education that, that you have. So no matter what somebody says to you, you don't come out a different person from when you came in. You don't come out a different psychology from when you came into that consulting space. And I guess even now, even with my approach, I would say there are five to 8% of patients who continue to come to my clinic, have a very long conversation with me and still come out leaving unsatisfied. And I see it. I see it in their body language. I see it in the way we interact. And I would like to say sorry to all of those patients, but it's a two-way process. Can I probably say, just comment on that, Boone, actually. Um, it, it, the idea you suggest is, is really much, much needed. And uh, probably what I can say is that the leads, so for, so for example, the leads community rehab service with uh, Manoj Sivan, when they set up this uh, crude diagnostic or overall Plot when patients got referred to their long COVID service or their COVID post COVID service back in August of 2020, they created this uh, tool called a Yorkshire Rehab Screen, so C19YRS uh, for the listeners there, and that tool is now the sort of only validated long COVID tool uh, by the NHS point, and that team has taken that whole tool concept to now a new app level where if people, so each, it is about 15 questions are asked about all the domains and it's scored between zero to 10 on each of the domains, whether it's anxiety, mood, bowel issues, concentration, fatigue, pain, et cetera. And what the app allows the doctor or the clinician using that tool to do is when they put their marks on there, it comes out as you know, a kind of a, a, almost I can imagine a compass plot, like the way you draw it there, where one might stand out a huge lot there. And that mm -hmm. gives an indication to the clinician that out of the 15 domains, probably four or five of the domains are massively out. And that gives hopefully a way to structure the first consultation to address those points there. We had a cruder version. So we had a digital questionnaire that went out to all our long COVID patients. So in our clinic, before this virus tool came along and this kind of uh, mappy bit came along, we had one question and that was kind of imported again from my pain clinic because I used to have this kind of uh, issue that you say that patients would come with a different expectation and they'd sit in front of the consultation and say, we want something else. And because I can't give it to them, they are upset about it or they feel disappointed. So we changed and pivoted about two years in our pain service. And we used that same question in our long COVID clinic there. We asked them, what would you like the long COVID clinic in terms of expectations? What are the things that are most important to you for us to address first? So that was almost our question that we gave in the questionnaire to every person who got referred to our service. And I got that we got that idea from speaking to the long COVID SOS support group. So at the beginning when we were setting the service, uh, we had emailed them and said, look, we are setting up the service here. What are the 10 things that you think a clinic should do? And they gave us back a whole set of points and they wanted that actual understanding to say, we want someone to listen to us and we want someone to address our most important things because we have 10 symptoms, but two might be more relevant. And so that was the benchmark to the question. 
and I still use that. And I think by far more than anything else that they may say, they will say all of these fatigue and everything. But then there are patients who would say, I want my loss of taste and smell to be addressed or I want my fatigue to be gone. They would have a shortness of breath score of 12 out of you know, 30, 10, but they would want the fatigue to be the one to be addressed the most. And that gave us an idea that when we get to see them, we, we push forward the agenda that you said that this is your most important point. How would you like us to address that? What do you want us to do about it? And how can we support you in that? So I think you're absolutely right. If we can actually make that kind of a compass map available and accessible to all patients, you know, almost I'm getting the idea now, Susie, is if, if we can't do it in, while we do it in a structured, researched, NHS-friendly manner, there's no reason why we can't get something simplistic coming out as a tool from for your for your group or something that's scalable and available so that that's something that the patient can take to their long cold clinics and say this is what i'd like my best help with absolutely what i do know is um and this kind of moves on to the next question um is that there is a longcovid.org website which has a whole ton of resources on already which offers patients templates to take to your doctor visit, you know, like fill in this information in advance. Because one of the things that's coming up again and again is, you know, people know how precious these moments are that they get with the doctor face to face. They know that that 10 minutes or 15 minutes that they're gonna get, it's, it's it, that's it. You know, they might not be seen again or that, you know, everything hangs. And if you're not well and your brain fog isn't in a great place that day and energetically, you're you're going to go in there and just be blinded by the importance of that experience. And then perhaps, you know, spend the rest of your week going, oh, I didn't say and I didn't talk about and I didn't. And so that, you know, it's such a wasted moment and people really are really stumbling at that kind of hurdle. And so I think this is one of the most fundamentally important things that people can do to prepare themselves. And there are templates, you know, I mean, have a look through longcovid.org because it is full of stuff like that, whether or not it's actually got what you're talking about right now, which I really love um, that kind of, you know, <laughs> I like the compass for me, it works visually um, just for, to help people go in more prepared so that they're getting absolutely the best that they can out of that tiny little moment, that window of, of opportunity to interact. Because I think it's really important. Can I Mel. just add to that last question, which is that if you do think you've got POTS or dysautonomia and you know, you've looked at this webinar and you've read some information and you think you do, then I, I would agree. So I think go in as prepared as you can. Um, and there, you know, so get the information that you've had off this webinar or go to the website POTS UK, for example, which has some really good information sheets. And the other thing to do that's very helpful, and I don't think any doctor would ever, I mean, I to generalize, if you say, I think I've got this based on these symptoms and these findings that I've, I've kind of recorded at home. So keep a symptom diary so that your doctor can have a look at it and see exactly what what's been going on and kind of to get a flavor of those symptoms so that if you do struggle for words on the day it's all written down and it's all documented in a nice way the other thing to do is if you have a fitbit or a smartwatch or anything like that and you can give a kind of range of your reading so if you say well you know when i'm resting my heart rate's 100 and then i get up to go to the toilet and it goes up to 160 and it stays that way all day, that it gives some very important information. Um, if you don't have a smartwatch, you can feel your pulse and measure it. Um, and then the other thing that can be quite helpful is getting a blood pressure machine, um, you know, one that you can, an automatic one that you can get at home and, and have some blood pressure recordings over the week. And then when you go to your doctor, you've got some objective information that you can say, look, these are my symptoms. I've read up on the POTS UK website um, and I've looked at the criteria, which are, among others, things like your heart rate rises by more than 30 beats per minute sustained on standing um, with no change in blood pressure. And I think I might have POTS. Where can we go from here? And I think if you do that, your doctor will be quite receptive to say, OK, I might not know too much about this, but let's look into it in more detail and maybe speak to a specialist. So I, I agree. Be prepared, equip yourself um, and have some documented evidence to take with you. Um, and, and then you've, you've got something to discuss with them. Right. Absolutely. You know, if, if a doctor, one would like to think, if a doctor looked at those stats that you were just describing, they'd say, something's not right here. <laughs> I might not know how to you know, explain this for you, but let's send you somewhere where we might be able to. Yeah. Absolutely. So can, can, can I just, um, sorry, make two specific points. One, the, the blood pressure cuff, if you're going to get it, get an upper arm cuff. Yeah. So one that sits on, on here, not a wrist or not one of those uh, 
watches that does the blood pressure, it's more accurate. Number two, it's crucially important to diarize your, your findings so that you make the most of your 15 minute conversation. Yeah. And number three, the website is potsuk.org. They are a phenomenal organization who have recently revamped the website and uh, a lot of the, the material there are, are written in a, a beautiful to understand way. Uh, so it's worth uh, empowering yourself with, with the knowledge that you could get for, for free. Mel and I run a resource, which is free called stopfainting.com. Uh, the, the time that we have to put into this charitable thing is uh, every Sunday. So it, it, it's, not, it's not very developed. I think we need to throw more money at it and get more funding to get somebody like a web uh, hoster or web designer to continue to put data there. But we also do our own webinars and, and where we can help uh, with specific things that we're seeing recurrently, we, we put a video up. So stopfainting.com, but potsuk.org is the, is the formal charity with very good quality information. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Hopefully that's some really good tips for those of you listening of things that you can do to help prepare yourselves a lot more for these big moments when you get face to face with uh, someone that you hope will help. OK, we're going to move on. We're going to be talking about research because I know some people were sort of saying, so surely, surely by now, all of the answers should have been found. The research has been happening. Come on, what, what, are, what are we waiting for? So let me just read out this question, Mel. Can you talk a little bit about research into long COVID and how long it all takes to come into usable data? We know that projects have started, but lots of patients would like to understand the amount of time that such projects might actually take. We all watch the development of a vaccine happen in a matter of months, although I would say the foundations of these vaccines have been in development and discussion for a very long time before COVID. And people are hoping that a silver bullet is also in development for something like POTS. Please help us understand how much time is needed to get usable data, which could lead to the development of a drug trial. The big question, right? So when's this silver bullet coming? <laughs> We're all waiting. It's a, it's a great question. And it's so frustrating. And, you know, we think, well, we're two years into the pandemic. Where, where, where's the answer and where are we going to get? So the first thing I would say, I think the answers are coming. Um, already, you know, every three days we hear something in the news or something on the paper about, about long COVID. And up until now, I mean, bearing in mind that the first time I think long COVID was mentioned in the literature was September 2020. So it's a very, very early disease and probably... In our life, you know, in all of our lifetimes, it, this is the, the first time this has ever happened. A new condition that so has affected every single person on the planet has, has come up. So answers are coming. At the moment, the studies that have been described have all been largely kind of observational. So clinicians like us, for example, saying, you know, this is what we've seen in our patients. Um, we've observed that people are coming with this problem and this problem. And could this be this? So there are a lot of observational things. And I think we all saw there was something on the BBC News yesterday about um, some lung scans and and these things will continue to to evolve so as findings arise or observations arise people will will publish on it but in order to properly evaluate something and examine something often a larger scale research study needs to be conducted um, and and if, if it's going to be done systematically and, and accurately there's, there's normally a protocol and a format to do that so a, whether or not it's an observational study or a randomized controlled trial a really good website, if you want to get an idea of the breadth of the research, is clinicaltrials.org, www.clinicaltrials.org. So whenever you do a large scale research design, um, you normally publish it on a, on a public database. And this is one of the biggest ones. And if you go onto that and just type into the search criteria long COVID or long haul COVID, it will show you all of the studies that have been registered on this biggest website, um, whether they're underway, whether they're recruiting or not. And it's showing at, at the moment about 140 studies. And I'd say about a, a third of them are looking at COVID, long COVID itself and characterizing it. So saying, you know, all we want to do is examine these patients, look at their hearts, look at their lungs, look at their gas exchange, look at their exercise tests, look at their brains, their nerves, their blood, and just determine what it is. And then the other studies are looking at interventions. So some of them are dietary supplements, some of them are immune medicines, some of them are drugs. Um, but a, a majority, I would say, are more the things we've talked about, exercise, physio, rehab, breathing interventions, a lot of mind-body interventions. There's one about singing to help rehab. So in order to do a study of, of, of that sort of type, 
it is quite a long process. So the first thing, so you need to get a group of researchers that say, I want to study this. That's the, the, the first thing. And then you get your collaborators. You then need to get money to, to conduct your study. Um, and it, that will normally take about six months to apply to a call and, and, and be given the money. And then you need to set it up. It then needs to go to an ethics panel where um, other people, or other researchers will kind of decide that it's an appropriate and fair study to do. You then need to run the study, which normally will take a year, two years. You then need to analyze the results and then publish them. So that is usually a couple of years. And that's quite a, a hard thing to, to kind of stomach. Some of the reasons that COVID obviously came together so quickly and some of the answers and the randomized control trials for COVID came so quickly were possibly because of the fact that the, the clinical, the, the, the global urgency to it. So the every single person in the world was threatened by this. So the governments and everyone else put a lot of money into it. All the drug companies had the money that they've, they needed to um, kind of push out these large scale studies. And also they had so many volunteers um, because people just came forward to volunteer to take part in vaccine trials and everything else, unlike any other condition in, in modern history. So I don't think it's going to be as rapid as it was for COVID, but I do think that the, the kind of political drive to it and the, the patient voices saying this is a problem, it needs to be studied, keep studying us. And some of the, the patient groups have been really important in that. So in short, a proper in terms of getting a systematic answer to some of these studies and trials that are going on, I think it will be possibly years rather than months. Myself, I don't think there's going to be one silver bullet. I think probably what we're going to learn is that this is a whole spectrum of conditions. As we were talking about this compass plot, there'll be different things and you know, there'll be different people that have different types of condition and different types of disease. And we will understand more about that. I do think those answers will come. Once we've characterized these specific syndromes in more detail, then particular things can be tested to see what works and what doesn't. Um, so I wouldn't put hope in a in a silver bullet or a cure coming soon. And I think that is why there's so much importance in focusing on what we know that works and what is proven to work. Um, the sleep, the, the, the gradual exercise and everything else. The other thing that I would say is have a look on the clinicaltrials.org website if you're interested and be aware that there are lots of and I think one of the the perils of of easy access to information and social media that we sort of touched on is the potential for misinformation. And there are a lot of websites and there are a lot of sometimes doctors or, or other people saying, this will work, this is a cure, come and have this treatment um, because it works, because obviously this is an immune condition and this is a, an immune therapy. And I say be very, very careful if it's not been studied um, because everything that we give and everything that every medication, every intervention, you always have to think about the benefits and the risks and everything has risks. If the benefit is overwhelming um, and the benefits outweigh risks, then it's something good to give. So for example, say steroids in, in acute COVID infection needing oxygen, we know there are loads of side effects and, and potential harm from steroids, but we know that the benefits are so much greater for treating acute COVID infection. And that should be the approach with long COVID as well. We need that there will be side effects for most treatments or interventions in terms of tablets or medicines, um, but the benefits need to outweigh them. So be very careful about thinking about interventions that you see on the website or on websites or that you hear about if they've not been studied, because the chances are there will be risks and we don't know about the benefits. Can I, can I just add to that, uh, Mel? Well, two, two, two things. The website actually is clinicaltrials.gov, G-O-V. Oh, uh, so that's, no, no, no yeah. it's fine. But, but the, the point you made um, about evidence-based trials and understanding the mechanisms, so coming back to the compass plot, um, I just like to make a point that, that actually, um, that there are disadvantages to an evidence-based approach. And, and I know that risks sounding provocative, especially in the crowd uh, of doctors uh, here. And I, I wonder what Deepak's take it will be on this as well. But there, there are huge risks with just uh, hanging your hat on a perfectly conducted randomized double-blind control uh, drug trial or an intervention, because it presupposes that your initial uh, inclusion criteria and the mechanisms of disease is correct. And, and, and as you know, 
if the mechanism of disease is multifaceted, let's take a simple example. I want to trial antihistamines, right? And I want to see whether it works for mast cell. If you think that mast cell degranulation is the fundamental cause of all long COVID symptoms, okay? It may or may not be. It may be present in 70%, but it may be present in 25%. And in those patients, in those 25% of patients, if you had a way of selecting just those patients and you gave them all antihistamines, they would, you'd have a remarkable outcome. The trial would be positive, right? Can you extrapolate that to the patients who don't have this mast cell? this degranulation disorder. And in fact, the bigger question is, how can you make sure that when you pick out your patients, you've only picked out those mast cell patients to start off with in a long COVID cohort? So it, it is such a mixed group of uh, mechanisms that create this long COVID syndrome that when you're reading, even on clinicaltrials.gov, you may not be able as a patient and sometimes as a physician, to read between the lines and to see what the inclusion criteria, how they screen for patients, whether that was specific enough to the question they have and the intervention they have. And so this is a very important point. And actually coming back to the benefits of somebody with experience. And I think the evidence base from experience is called intuition in my view. And somebody like Deepak, who's seen thousands of patients, somebody like Susie, who again runs a consistent group of thousands of patients, will know from experience because they've seen the patients and they know what works for each individual patient. And antihistamines, as you know, Susie, doesn't work for all those patients in your Facebook group. They don't, they simply don't. And for some others, including yourself, you've said before, it was like a fire that that was, was snuffed and you were able to sleep again. And, and clearly it worked for you, but you can't extrapolate that to so many. And so be, be very careful. Um, uh, and you know, I, I wonder whether I could get Deepak's opinion on this because I don't want to sound anti-evidence-based, but I'm, uh, I, I also want to put out there that, that we all have to exercise a bit of judgment uh, as well. And you know, not look at this trial and think it will be the thing that solves the problem for you, i.e., no silver bullet still. Exactly. You're muted, Deepak. <laughs> I muted myself again. After two years of doing this thing, I should know better. Um, <laughs> thanks, Boone, for that for that intro there. I, I, you know, there's this eternal conflict we have within the scientific community there, and I, probably the best way to say is that. There are lots of things that we've gained by doing evidence-based practice, but the complexity of the kind of healthcare problems we are starting to face now, we need to now look at what's called practice-based evidence. You know, what are we picking up from looking after patients or seeing patterns that come through and how can that guide us towards a better way of supporting patients and, and getting health back rather than disease care. And I think, that's the challenge we've got to understand within our scientific community so that we can present a slightly unified approach to patients who expect us to know all the answers. And yeah, at the outset, I'd say, I don't think without sounding discouraging to all your listeners, Susie, I don't think we'll find ever a silver bullet for this condition because I come at it from an evolutionary point. You know, We have always coexisted with every else on the planet you know um, there was an somebody said this statement that if uh, if all of human beings you know if all of insects vanished from this earth then nothing would be alive but if all of human beings vanished from the earth life would still flourish um, uh, and and uh, we have to accept that we are always coexisting with everything and occasionally our immune systems and nervous systems are going to be looking out and meeting a strange new person they've never seen before, and they are going to do all they can to protect us. And that's what the Wuhan or the COVID strain or whichever, wherever that particular experiment, you take all the conspiracy theories that are out there, but along comes a new virus, and this is not going to be the end of it as we go into the Amazon rainforest or the global warming brings along the Siberian landscape. More such weird organisms will come, which the human immune system and nervous system would not have faced before, and will mount a challenge 
which will be at a system level. The whole of the body will mount the challenge. So it will be a wide whole body response that will come, but our medical faculties have all grown up to look at it as individual organ system specialists. The oologist has Boona said. So we are always going to have this struggle between oologists who will, will know one organ very well versus an organism which will affect the entire immune and nervous system. And so the basics will never change that we need to find a way to calm that immune system and nervous system down once it, ha it has done its job of identifying this new organism and finding a way to coexist with it peacefully because that organism also needs to survive and replicate and move on, which is why the Omicron variant and the next four or five variants that will come will probably be of milder variation unless and until something changes on the side. But if we will get these things coming through. So I think the force is on, on us to actually say, what can we do to calm the nervous and immune system downs? How holistically should we be supporting our patients while the particular specialists then find a more specific way to tackle one aspect of how the organism, whether it's a virus or a bacteria or a parasite, affects a particular organ. I think that need will be there, but we also need to find a way as a system to pay for, to finance, to resource and support the entire system in calming down. I think the way I tend to look at how we should look after people is where evidence-based medicine is really good is when we know cause and effect. So that's like, if you imagine like a, a north-south, a, a plot like way Boone has suggested, you have the bottom right wherein you have evidence-based medicine when there is cause and effect, excellently proven. Then you have the top right, which is slightly complicated, wherein you are not sure, like the watchmakers thing, it's slightly complicated, but to an expert, it would be fairly straightforward. And that might be the case of a surgical operation or something where you can depend on expertise and you can have good practice, not best practice, but good practice based on evidence. But a lot of healthcare, I think, is sitting on the left top, which is the complex. There are lots of connections, there are a lot of relations, and many of these we will not understand which system affects how, what are the organs, what are the problems, what are the social, the outside and the inside influences, the gut, the microbiome, everything. And in that kind of situation, we should only be probing and trying out and seeing where the challenges practice change and then move forward and move the direction towards bringing the whole system back into equilibrium rather than what we do now. And a lot of healthcare, I think, is in the complex domain. And we sometimes do the wrong for our patients by making it pretend as if everything has one cause and effect and silver bullet. And that's where we come a cropper. Well said, Deepak. Thank you. Uh, goodness. Now, I almost feel um, sort of wrong for bringing in the words microclotting now, having just listened to everything that you've just said, but I promised that I would bring it up, right? <clears throat> this is what people need us to explore a little bit. So as you all know, uh, microclotting has been getting a little bit of airtime and you know, we've got one of those life rafts floating past again that a bunch of people have gone. This could be the, the answer to everything, is it? Um, I would just love to hear any thoughts from any of you <laughs> about what someone should do if that's, you know, that's where their brain is drawing them. Because I know that diagnostically in this country, it's very difficult to even get yourself tested. So, you know, it's another one of those things. Do you sit and wait thinking I've got, I, I'm, I'm going to have my, I've definitely got microclots in my blood. That's the cause of it. I'm going to wait for diagnostic to be available which might be a really, really long time. Deepak, maybe I could come to you and I know you've just spoken, but um, just thoughts. I'm, I'm actually, a patient has emailed me four days ago. She's come back from South Africa and oh, she's yeah. had something life-changing apparently and she wants to come and tell my team about it and we are going to call her in the next couple of weeks and, and find out what it is. So I am expecting it might be something like this. I watched the videos with Dr. Asad Khan and his uh, YouTube de description of how the treatment is. I, I look forward to hearing what uh, Boone and, and Melanie 
think about this as well. But my, my, my take would be slightly similar to what I just now said, Susie, is that, yes, you know, if we can find a way to make that resource uh, cheap, economical, and safely available with a slightly better quality of evidence than what it is now, then yeah, that could be one aspect of managing it. Doesn't change all the other things that we need to put in place for our patients and our patients maybe need to have already in place. Maybe they're already doing it and that's why they are wanting to trial this new thing out. Um, but I, I don't know enough about it. There are things that people are telling me. I'm reading about it. I've read Dr. Pretorius's research trial. So I'm aware right. of the technology, but I, I, I would need more expertise. And then if people had to give blood thinners and all that, it would I would be turning to specialists like Boone to say, what is the right thing to do? You know, is it safe? Because that's, again, you know, I, I'm the oology who will fall short of that expertise in that front. So over to you, Boone and Melanie, what are your thoughts on this? I, I feel very similar to you. Um, and I also have watched Asad Khan's videos, his BBC interview and his video with uh, Jez. And, and actually what strikes me is that uh, there needs to be a repeated cycling. And just so that your audience know what we're talking about, microclots are the, um, are the finding of small blood clots that are floating around freely in your bloodstream that can conceivably be removed by this uh, program called help apheresis. And what this means is a heparin uh, uh, extra corporal uh, LDL and cholesterol particle removal. Now it sounds very complex, but this is a therapy that was introduced to take out the cholesterol particles in patients who were suffering with repeated heart attacks and who didn't have the sufficient response with LDL lowering with a statin, for example, which is the most commonly prescribed cholesterol drug. And so through two big needles, we put your blood through a dialysis machine. And this dialysis machine has a filter that takes out many particles. And one of those particles include uh, microclots or, or, or blood clots. And so this has now been repurposed uh, beyond the cholesterol market uh, into a potential treatment for long COVID. The two things to say, one, it is not without its risks. Taking your blood out, spinning it through a dialysis machine and coming back into your system with fully heparinized is not without its risks. Number two, I need to learn a bit more and hear the evidence base and hear exactly as we talked about with the compass plot, which patient would benefit more from this particular therapy. And right now, what I'm hearing is very, very interesting from Asad Khan that the D-dimers and fibrinogen can be entirely normal. And so you don't have any sense that you have or have not got microclots. So if I come back to uh, you know researching the chapter of my book, which is coronary atherosclerosis, I found, and I, actually most people don't know this, that the most common inflammatory condition of your body, I guess, could be coronary atherosclerosis. So that means that the, the blood vessels that supply your arteries, your brain, your whole body are undergoing inflammation all the time. And why is it undergoing inflammation? The typical things such as a poor diet, laden with sugar, processed foods, lack of sleep, stress, all these things we recognize now as a really credible source of inflammation is proven in so many scientific papers. Now, inflammatory responses give you a global state. The cytokines, which are specific proteins within your blood circulating in the whole body, either the humoral system or expressed by the cells of your endothelium, which are the lining of your arteries in a very localized way, can be extremely pro-inflammatory. And guess what they do? They promote inflammation. And what does inflammation do? It promotes clotting. It promotes all these reactions, including platelet activation. So we come back to the fundamentals, right? And we understand that atherosclerosis is one of the most globally available inflammatory responses that are present in all of us who are eating uh, the foods which we 
like to eat, like the sugar in processed foods and all these other things that we keep coming back to because they are fundamental in allowing this inflammatory process to continue. And, and I think micro clotting is a, is a subset of that. And no doubt the immune mediated trigger of inflammation can cause a degree of micro clotting. And that's why I think the mechanism may make sense. But I think the treatment specifically help apheresis is only one very downstream treatment. It's like saying, it's like saying, doc, I've come in with a heart attack. Uh, can you put a stent in? And I put a stent in, or somebody puts a stent in, or have a bypass surgery. But they leave surgery and they keep smoking. They keep sleeping very poorly. They keep eating sugary foods. What's going to happen? So why do patients keep having to go back for the sixth, for the seventh apheresis uh, session. And, and Asad Khan has said he's at six or seven and he's at relapses in between. Surely if it, if it was a miracle cure and you took away the clots just like that and it was a all or nothing, i.e. Uh, like a cancer, you cut away the cancer, you throw it away and actually the body functions perfectly normally. Unfortunately, it's not so simple. The processes by which the clots are formed in the first place, assuming that theory is right, will continue to persist if you don't change something else fundamentally. So that would be my, my take on that. Can I just add that, um, again, having talked about risks and benefits and everything we do, and that there is, again, on, on clinicaltrials.gov, there, there, there are studies looking at the hematological parameters in, in COVID and what changes and what doesn't. But I would agree uh, that exposing someone to a very invasive treatment that has risks is an invasive, is an invasive um, treatment. It has risks for a condition where there are no detectable abnormalities yet that we know of in conventional medicine. Um, sounds like a treatment that's maybe going to impose risks on someone without any studied benefits, and I would be very, very cautious um, about recommending it. Um, until more is known. My answers may well come, um, but it's, I, I, I would agree that I don't think that's going to be a, a, a bullet. Really glad to hear you all say that because, you know, I watch people respond to this information in, you know, my Facebook group and in the other Facebook groups. And so many people are going, oh my goodness, well, if that's the answer, how do we afford that? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that it's really easy to forget when you're actively involved in a, in a kind of support group like the size of some of the social media groups out there now is that there are thousands and thousands of people who've got better and they've left those groups and they're not still there going, ah, yes, we all think it's microclotting. You know, there are thousands of people who've got better without knowing anything about microclotting. Um, <clears throat> and so essentially, you know, what I would love people to come back to is, what can you do for yourself? How can you reduce inflammation yourself? What is it that you know I'm in charge of in my own home without having to leave my house or spend 3000 pounds? What can I do? Oh, and look, there's a whole lot of stuff I can do that's free and easy and gentle and calming and that I can begin right now. Um, you know, I think it's so much more empowering than thinking, how do I get to Germany to have my blood filtered? I can't ever afford that. Oh no, does that mean I'll not get better? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't because you know, there's just so many, there's so many stories of recovery now, people that have gone through this journey and come out the other side slowly and gently with grace and they're back, you know, they're back doing lives and they, they didn't go to Germany and have their blood filtered. Um, so I think it's really important to hang on to that too. Thanks guys. I think, <laughs> I think that's what we need to find out, Susie, actually lots of recovery stories, that lived experience of right. people who have gone through the journey and come out the other end and their narratives are important because we can, again, same thing as I said, you know, probe and then respond. And when you're in the complex side there, understanding what each perspectives are and finding out how the recovered patients recovered, what did they do? And then look for patterns there that they did in a predictable fashion. And that would be probably the practice-based evidence that we'd have, we'd need. And that's what I think long COVID clinics should do is to engage back with their communities. Because again, it's community and context dependent. Somebody's life in Yorkshire is very different from somebody's life down south here in, in bustling London with tubes and trams. But we need to take that narratives and actually say, 
what can then long COVID clinics do and what can people like yourself do in terms of getting these narratives to come back and talk to other people? Because somehow I feel, and I learned this from pain management side, people will always listen and be willing to trust someone who is gone through that and come out the other side than maybe someone like me who can probably just sit and talk about it, but not have the experience of going through life every day feeling like that. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why people, you know, started coming to my recovery group because I was talking their language. You know, here was I, a regular woman in her 40s, very busy, kids, career, and this floored me. Uh, and I was using a language that they understood and what I was also demonstrating, and I've got better and look, I'm now running a group and now, you know, I'm kind of back and my life is, is the one that I want again. Um, and I create a place of belief and safety for people, um, which I think is really, really phenomenally empowering for people's, you know, the kind of the magic soup of, of brain chemical that goes on there and helps with the, with the stuff that we want to have happen in people's bodies. So, yeah. And I think one of the hardest things about long COVID as well, isn't it, is the fact that it it's long. It takes so right. long to get it's better. The and thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's not something that we in our life of instant gratification are used to. You know, I want, I've got infection. I want a pill. I want to get back right. to my 10K running right. tomorrow. And I suppose, and, and you, Susie, are probably the person to advise on how do you be patient and how do you, how do you stop that desire for or do, do you kind of deal with that the thing that, that the sense that I might be ill for six months or 12 months right. and it's such a hard and awful reality to have to come to terms with it is it's but the it's, worst part of it it's the worst yeah, part yeah um and we're not used to it in our lives yeah. and in our probably in all the illnesses that we've faced collectively to date this is a right. new thing and it's and I suppose all those techniques that again you teach and that we've talked about learning how to manage with what you've got on a day-to-day -day basis is the key um while you, yeah and it's it's hard it's um and it's a million dollar question the way that I describe that the, the kind of key point at which I say your recovery begins you know so you're ill and you get maybe more ill and you know the long COVID thing begins to emerge and we're approaching recovery the way we approached recovery from a chest infection a flu you know a, 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 a tonsillitis whatever we kind of we take medication we run at something and we hit the wall with long COVID we slide down so we go back here and we run at it and we hit the wall again and we're sliding down and we're just doing that constantly and, you know, this might be for three months and eventually you sit down and go, OK, nothing that I've tried in the past has worked. So I need to accept that this is different. And in that moment of acceptance, there's a kind of surrendering to it. And that's when really understanding the old fine art of convalescence comes back into play. And we've eradicated it from society totally. You know, take a lemsit, Max, and get yourself back to work, my friend. Um, and that doesn't work with this, you know, and so I see a wonderful rise of the literature that people are reading now, that beautiful book, Wintering, um, you know, and, and the fine art of rest, you know, and all of these books that are coming back into play because people are going, I need to learn how to do this. <laughs> I need to Literally, learn how we to need to learn. Right. We need to almost relearn that. Uh, have, have your listeners or have you, Susie, uh, read this new book by Gavin Francis, exactly as you said, Recovery, The Lost Art of Convalescence. It just came out a couple of weeks ago it and it's did, been yeah. fantastic yeah. there. Very small book. I'd heartily recommend that. It was in The Guardian. Mm -hmm. I shared the article on Sunday. It's there. All of this literature is becoming much more, you know, the place that people are sort of absorbing information now. But I think number one key is acceptance that if you keep running up the wall and looking for that cure, you're just going to keep banging your head. And then it's about sitting still and going, I need to look at everything. I need to stop what I'm doing. I need to change how I'm approaching this. I need to develop a side of me that is my healing self rather than my career self or my you know, ambitious self. I need to look after myself. And that's a conversation that most people have never really had to have with themselves before. And it's a tough one. You know, I watch people trying to have it and I can see those who are just like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, time. <laughs> yeah, it probably gives you an equal measure. I mean, in terms of response, equal measure of inspiration and um, 
and anxiety or provocation uh, in 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 I can see that in my patients when I try and introduce the concept as well and I guess you you face a lot of this in in your group because those guys exactly as you said who've got lives careers uh, families uh, rent uh, to make uh, they, they're not going to take to this very kindly and so oh, it's, it's uh, you know it's very hard yeah and there's so many implications, you know, I, I do see people losing salaries and people having to sell their homes because they're on universal credit. I see those stories daily. And you say to them, read this nice book called Wintering, The Art of Convalescence. Why don't you just take six months off? How about a trip abroad somewhere? That's really going to help. <laughs> and they're like, OK, I've just lost Absolutely. my home. My kids are now, you know, uh, the social services are helping. It's that's, that's kind of not where I am. And we can't help right now but you know I, so which is why i understand the call for a silver bullet help me because i cannot help myself physically can't and that's really tough we are as always you know we could talk forever but i do have some really short answer now short answer guys okay short <laughs> answer questions <laughs> um so a question about antihistamines um so how do we get off antihistamines and what would be a good sign that the body was ready is long-term usage of this drug detrimental? Boone, apparently I'm to come to you here. Yeah, so I, I would say very simply, listen to your body. And, and actually, normally when I prescribe it, I prescribe it for, for a week on a trial basis. And if, if the patient does have uh, an element of, say, mast cell activation contributing to the symptoms and they feel benefit, just like as you described to me in the past, Susie, like within yeah. your first or second dose, it's like the fire went out. Then I'd continue for three months. At that point, see how many times the fire was rekindled, how many times you're blowing that fire and it's starting up. And if you feel that you're completely clear, then trial for a period of three or four days off if it comes back and start it again and don't stop for six six weeks to eight weeks and then try again and and generally you know just just oh you asked for a short answer but the the <laughs> the link the link is actually the global adrenaline or stress response is very priming of histamine uh, or the mast cells because what, what are mast cells there for? Evolutionarily, when you're facing whatever saber-toothed cat uh, and you get scratched, for example, or you get bitten, you want a very instant reaction. So you want inflammation in that region so your white cells can come and heal the area of scarring in that battle that you've just taken. But when you're constantly on a low level chronic stress, you don't need this spontaneous inflammation to occur. And so um, when you can dial down that and you know you're in a better place, ask yourself, is this the time to stop? And generally that goes for all medications, including patients in whom we've prescribed metadrine, fludocortisone, and any number of other agents that we can sometimes use, such as ivabradine, propanolol. It's always a very similar answer, which is be guided by yourself. Great. Love that. Thank you. Uh, okay, Deepak, this one is for you. After 20 months, I'm left with painful arms, tingling hands and numbness in my fingers. Uh, I know several people with lung COVID who have similar. Any thoughts on what could be the cause and the possible resolution? It's a tricky one to give you 60 seconds on, but I'm going to see if you can do it, Deepak. I believe in you. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, I, I will just take Boone's answer from the last part there is when you're having a low level continuous level of inflammation going on, your nervous system gets sensitized. So mm -hmm. in patients with long COVID, this kind of multiple aches and joints and pains, we've done x-rays initially, we've done scans, we find some age-related changes, but that's not accounting for it. So the present understanding of the pain is that this is due to uh, winding up and a sensitization of the nervous system as a whole because of the immune system being low level. So attempts at calming the immune system down using a variety of those techniques, uh, all the lifestyle measures we talked about, diet, sleep, those would be the ones I would pay most attention to because the medications for pain that I have prescribed or can prescribe can cause more unacceptable side effects, which patients don't like because it makes their fatigue worse. So I have found that discussing with them or discussing with your GP or clinician, make sure that the medications are appropriately taken for the right duration of time. But please, please, please focus on the other ways to calm your nervous and immune system because that is likely to be of more greater help with lesser side effects. Nice. 
well done, thank you. <laughs> you did well with the time frame. Um, and actually that leads really beautifully to a question about sleep. Now, um, actually no, let's do adrenaline dumping because that will follow on beautifully from sleep into sleep. Um, so Boone, this one is for you. Can you explain adrenaline dumping and racing heart at night? Is there anything I can do to help? Uh, so quick question is when we think of autonomic dysfunction, it tends to be triggered when we stand upright, blood pools into lower limbs, you have a reduction in stroke volume, reduction in blood pressure, and the reaction from your autonomic nervous system is to give you a surge of adrenaline to maintain that cardiac output. So your blood uh, uh, pressure increases when the heart pumps stronger and you have some vasoconstriction. But it doesn't figure at night. So this theory doesn't work at night. And so when you wake up at night, not to pee, not because you're getting up on the side of the bed to pee and then you have palpitations when you're standing. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about waking with sweatiness, with palpitations and with shortness of breath. That to my mind is one of the features of mast cells. So if I had to ask a question, discerning question for me, and this is anecdotal, my experience is that this could be a sign like you have had, Susie, that your mast cells are being active at night. And somehow when they degranulate, you don't need this autostatic challenge anymore. You don't need to be upright to pull blood because when the mast cells degranulate, they make your vessels all vasodilate. That means they expand. And when they expand, they take blood away from your heart and your brain, and then you trigger that reaction. So that adrenaline dumping and racing heart at night is seldom a sign. I mean, I've looked at tens or hundreds of halters, which are all performed, and it all almost always shows sinus tachycardia. Um, sinus tachycardia is your normal heart rate racing, and that means that there's something else driving that, and that, that normally uh, res responds quite well to antihistamines. I think it also responds to a nighttime routine, which I do myself, which is 10 minutes of mindful breathing, typically with a body scan meditation, and maybe we don't spend enough time on this uh, webinar talking about that, but that would be an important thing for everyone to do, whether you have COVID, long COVID or not, I think it's very empowering. And maybe you can speak to that if you want to, yeah. <laughs> well, I think doing, you know, I, I see a lot of people really, really struggling with this in the groups. Um, and, you know, the thing that I say is, put your screens down from 7 p.m., right? Stop engaging in social media, listening and talking with other people who've got this illness, this, you know, because all you're doing is triggering that fight flight response. We're all in this, we're all ill, no one's getting better, panic, panic. And, you know, and whether or not you're conscious of it, just the fact that you're checking in constantly with the illness of others, your illness, you know, the illness in the world means that you're going to go to bed having a hyper stimulated, hypersensitized system. Um, that you're just basically not giving yourself time off from. So, you know, I would always encourage, you know, put all of that down from 7 p.m., read a book, listen to an audio book, listen to a guided meditation, do some breath work, watch a comedy movie if you want to do something in the evening, you know, have something lighthearted to engage in. Go to bed later, perhaps, than you might. So a lot of people are very, very tired and they're saying, well, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go to bed really early. But then they're waking up at one because that kind of that, that thing starts to happen again. And I'm, part of me wonders if it's something to do with circadian rhythms, you know, that kind of those natural adrenaline surges that we would have had anyway. Um, so, you know, just tinker with the routine a little bit, kind of mess with the pattern a bit. So, you know, make sure you're really, really tired when you go to bed and see if that helps you to stay asleep a little bit longer. And then also just allow yourself to know that resting is good. Just because you haven't had that eight hours sleep doesn't mean you're not resting and lying there and getting really stressed about it. And I know it's easy to do because I did it myself. You know, actually that's not helping it. For me, it was okay when I started to reframe, oh, I'm waking up at four o'clock in the morning every day, but it's okay, it's okay, mm -hmm. you know. I'm, I'm awake and I've had some sleep and that's fine. And actually when I remembered who I was as a mother of two small children, I didn't get very much sleep then. And that was okay, you know, I'm still here. So I kind of would always reframe it. And that made a really big difference. So I've gone over my, over 60, my own 60 second rule here massively, but <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really big and important question. Uh, Cause I know a lot of people really struggle with the sleep. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move on. Uh, 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 okay, Mel, 
can you, oh, this is a biggie. Can you briefly, briefly explain how long COVID affects the hormonal cycle? And maybe just give us your kind of top sentence to that. Yeah, so it does, uh, has been reported. Uh, changes in length, changes in volume, changes in kind of prolonging your, your bleeding time. Also reported with the vaccine usually yeah. goes back to normal after a couple of cycles yeah the thing to the kind of key thing to um highlight is that don't attribute symptoms to long covid if they persist so for example in particular if you have bleeding in between periods or if you have bleeding after sex or if you have pain that doesn't go away that's probably not well that won't be released to long covid and see your doctor um and if if things don't change after a couple of months then your gp can help um, to either regulate your cycle or to help with pain, depending on what the problem is. But in the in the large in the in the uh, broadly, uh, changes do happen. Uh, they tend to be quite uh, non-specific and get better after a couple of cycles. Um, and it sort of makes sense whenever the hormonal cycle is very sensitive to stress. If you're going through emotional distress or physical illness, or if you lose weight, your body stops because obviously it doesn't want to grow a baby um, and support a pregnant body if it's not well. So it's your body's way of saying, I'm going to hold off pregnancy while I recover. Brilliant. Um, Susie, I probably will be asking uh, Melanie to probably just go a little bit beyond the 60 seconds there because I have a lot of patients asking and my GP colleagues, my gynae colleagues and myself, we're not sure about this concept of problems occurring around the perimenopausal period, whether it brings on menopause earlier, and the role of HRT. Melanie, what are your thoughts on that? Or rather, Susie? <laughs> Can I just say something here? Because it's a, such a big topic. I've got a whole separate interview on oh, okay. the panel with two doctors, one who specializes in menopause, and we talk about this for over an hour. Perfect. So I've just pulled you back Thanks, out of Susie. that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tackle that one right now because it's a biggie. Um, and yes, there is a lot of discussion around that. And, you know, Deepak, if you haven't seen the interview, definitely give it a watch. OK, I will then. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, Boone, very quickly. How high is it sensible to let your HR go with pots when moving about? Uh, I would be guided by symptoms, not your heart rate or tracker is the nice. very short answer. So actually just how you feel. Stop looking at your wrist and the, the data that's coming in and go, actually, can I feel like I can move about? Is Do I feel like I'm going to die? Sorry, I need another 30 seconds. I think how, <laughs> how, how you feel, how you feel on the day is uh, very important. But what's more important for to prevent you from crashing onto that wall and falling down is how you feel the day after or six hours after. So I think when you train, you might you might train on a high energy um day and you might want to push yourself instead of a walk around the block you might do a jog and if you feel fine during the jog you might say okay i'm good and then you crash for the next three days that's too much so the next time you want to do the same thing and you feel so good try and put the restraints on yourself and and, and remember what happened afterwards so it's very difficult for us to to stay within our limits when we feel so good. So we just have to think about exercise is how we feel now and then how we feel afterwards to inform the next exercise. Pacing right. explained in 30 seconds. Thank you, Boom. <laughs> you guys are really good at this. Uh, okay, let's see. Mm. Deepak, many people are left feeling very unwell after the booster, sometimes, well, after the vaccines and the booster, right? So sometimes it can knock people back into what feels like early stages of long COVID. They want to vaccinate, but they don't want the detrimental impact. What advice would you give a patient who's had a bad experience around this? I mean, are we talking about that, you know, just stay off them for a while because chances are there's going to be another one coming out at some point, right? What, what are your thoughts? Because everyone has this kind of wobble around it. Yeah, and I think in the beginning phase with the first two vaccines, I'd probably at the outset, Melanie, I just want to, sorry, Susie, I, I want to keep within the 60 seconds. I okay. think the first two doses do make a difference in the overall intensity in terms of severity of the condition. So I think I would definitely recommend as far as possible, try to get that vaccination part there and see whether you can ride out because at the end of the day it is just the immune system getting fired up so previous people with symptoms may experience and then i've had both groups i've had patients getting better with the vaccine and i've right. had patients getting worse 
for mm -hmm. a few days to a week or two weeks, and then they recover again. So in all the vaccinated patients who have had flare-ups after vaccine, it has recovered back, but I'm hoping that the benefit of protection will outlast the temporary flare-up that they're having. So that's my take on that. I think the boosters and beyond there, I, I'm, I'm unsure of the evidence and I watch that space with more anticipation. Okay, great. I'm definitely anecdotally seeing people who are being really kicked for, you know, down for sort of oh, four for to six time. weeks okay. And, okay. and sort of going, I can't do that again. I just can't, you know, because I just got to the kind of a point where I was beginning to get something back on. Okay, we, we have to we have to put that one on pause because we do not know. Um, so let's just go with question 17, which is what are your top three tips for recovery, knowing what we know at this point in January 2022? And I'm going to come to each of you in turn. So just literally give me a top three. What do you want people to focus on, Mel? And I'm going to come to you first. I'd say live for the moment. So take each day as it's, it comes learn ways and I think that's probably through you Susie of acceptance and learning to deal with a chronic set of symptoms yeah. and have hope have hope yeah. that you will get better and the answers will come in some way or another stay informed stay powerful and keep your voice up and you know take your symptoms and keep your diaries and be assertive with your doctor um and get the answers th that you need and keep engaging in educational webinars and empowering and equipping yourself. Um, yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Mel. Boone, let's come to you. Uh, pacing. We talked about that. Yeah. Uh, being kind to self and mm. focusing the uh, control of the illness uh, back to your own self rather than from without. And I think finding purpose in life um, could be an important one having a reason to wake up um, which which really um, energizes and inspires and I think we all know what that feels like when there's something like a project to fight for a family a job to fight for we we wake up with purpose we don't lie in bed all day uh, and e even in the most challenging situations that purpose will, will drive us forwards to heal Lovely. Thanks, Boone. Deepak. Um, I think a lot has been already covered by both of them, but I would say to all your listeners that you're dealing with a very threatened immune and nervous system. Think of every way that you would want to calm and soothe that system down. And whether that's rest, digest and relax, find ways to achieve that. And that would be the focus. The second point is it's not a one person job. You need to look for support around you. Resilience is not something that comes from within you. It is how the measure of support. So if you can seek support from your family members, from your workers, from your colleagues, and be transparent and accepting that you need that support at this period of time to help you through this period, then I think that would be most important. Letting that ego or that pride go is very important. And that feeds into what you say, Susie, of acceptance in that way. You're not trying to give in to it, but you're trying to work alongside it because you want your immune system and your nervous system to be your friends and allies. That's what they are. That's what they're doing. They're doing their job. You just need to help them in their job. Wonderful. Thanks, all of you. That's amazing. Um, let's just do a little tiny book check. Uh, so one book that I know I'm a huge fan of is Cured by Dr. Jeff Rediger. This is a phenomenal book and actually talks about the science behind the, the kind of things that have just been shared there as the top three tips. So if you're looking for something to listen to on Audible or to actually hold in your hand and read, this book talks about the power of placebo, the power of connection, the power of joy, the power of belief, as well as a lot of other stuff, but researched and, and sort of proven to have this extraordinary impact on people's ability to recover from things. Um, I know Boone has a great book, How to Have a Healthy Heart by Dr. Boone Lim. 
that one, you know, particularly if your heart is one of your key areas of sort of concern for you, the book's incredibly reassuring. And I would, you know, definitely check that one out. And Deepak's got The Pain-Free Mindset. Um, great book. He has a, uh, your acronym, don't you? That kind of, um, what's the acronym that you use? Oh, it, the mindset is the play there, but I... Mindset, great, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, there we go. So again, watch the interview that I've done with Deepak. We talk about the book there and the, and the kind of, the protocol that you have around managing pain and it all you know it all works together to to help us realize that there's a lot more that we can do to help ourselves recover than we think and i think that is one of the most beautiful things that we could kind of finish this interview on because actually we do have these extraordinary brains in our bodies that know stuff that we're not even aware that they know uh just give them feed them the right information and they will thrive. That's basically where I'm at. Um, so guys, thank you very much for your time today. Of course, we've gone over time and I'm so sorry about that, but you've been amazing. I thank you all from my heart and, and I'm sure everyone else that's been watching this recording. Thank, thank you. you so much thank for inviting Susie. us, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie, for having us. You're welcome.